Woo! Stuff is happening. Yeah. Hallelujah. What, what a strategic thing for God to allow us to be on this mountain these whole months. Yeah. Such a strategic thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged every time that I uh, see everyone here that gets up like last night and read scripture and testify and prays and proclaims and declares. And it makes it tougher on me because I know I'm not with uh, new beginners in this deal. That you challenged me to go to a higher place. Hallelujah. And you know, we're, we're, we have a mature group of people that I believe that can, uh, Lord, that we can host what you want to do in our midst, Lord God. We're, we're not going to be easily swayed or knocked off our feet, Lord God. But we are pressing in and going after this thing. And God, there's so much at stake, God. We're going after the high prize of the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, there's, there's lives and cities and nations at stake, God, with what's taking place. I believe there's so much more will be revealed one day when we get to heaven that uh, what was taking place. And, you know, the, the uh, some that show up every night and uh, it's, it's more than just a commitment. Something's happening. And, you know, we're making that commitment to the Lord. And as we look at revivals, it's because a group of people made a commitment to God. And they got passionate to go after what was available. And God answered and poured out his Holy Spirit. So uh, we just, we know God has great and mighty things in our midst. And uh, wow, that we're getting to be able to pray these nights over what's happening in our election. That's the most powerful thing we can do is pray together, agree together. If one can send a thousand to flight, two can send ten thousand to flight. So there's like millions to flight in this place. Woo! And uh, hearing the testimonies and seeing what God's doing, and we do pray after uh, the testimony tonight on on marriage. Lord, we pray for those that may be struggling in their marriages. God, we pray that you would bring restoration. Uh, that you'd restore, God, what God has joined together. Let no man separate in the name of Jesus. Just take uh, divorce out of your vocabulary. And, uh, you know, there, there's times when somebody's being abused physically and things are happening that you need to remove yourself from that situation. But uh, God can work uh, things out in the midst. So, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, it's powerful water baptisms. Yes. Uh, we, there, there was a group of us, um, wow, close to two years ago, that were at the Northwest uh, Georgia Revival, okay. where, um, I mean, that thing's still going on, so awesome. on Sunday nights, every Sunday night. And so when we were there, they, they were baptizing, like, they're baptizing 300 to 400 people every Sunday night. Yeah. Yeah, that's, they got, they got a wonderful baptistry. They got a waterfall coming down in this huge, all 10 of us got in the baptistry together and uh, they were able to, and it just happened to be that the normal person that baptized had to go. And so the pastor baptized and prophesied over every one of us. And they also talked about there being an impartation for what's going on in their baptistries. Uh, uh, that baptistry, and then they had a whole big, huge round swimming pool that could hold probably 20 people. They were baptizing them coming and going. So uh, we just believe God that, and they prophesied this impartation for baptism would go with wherever we went. And uh, I mean, it's a combination of things, but uh, we just believe, uh, I know last night there was somebody I thought, man, they need to get in the baptistry right now. And uh, the water wasn't in there last night, but it is in there tonight. And so, you, you know, we schedule for Sundays, but if, if you got an unction that you need to get in the water, we will get you in the water. Woo! Yeah, he saw fire. Yeah, fire in the water. The... Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
Amen. <laughs> Woo! Praise God. So we, we just believe in, and, you know, uh, marriages restored, people's lives transformed, a combination of everything that's coming together, you know, uh, having fivefold ministry and yeah. people praying and yeah. an old piece of carpet and uh, <laughs> stuff just happening. You know, we... Uh, a young lady came and asked us, I believe they've already left, but asked us to pray for her mother. Was that pastor? Was it her mother that has stage four cancer? Meta uh, meta uh, what? Metastasize. Metastasize. So it's spreading. And uh, so we got to go back at the start. And she hadn't been out of the house in six months, but had been watching on TV and made it up here tonight to be prayed for. So, Father, we agree together, God, for a miracle in that situation. God, that that cancer has got to bow down and it's got to go in the name of Jesus. She was getting the joy back there. Wow. <laughs> Pastor and I was praying. She, has just had, she was looking happy. And she also said, her, when her daughter came up, she said, I'd taken, uh, Pastor had prayed over one of these fire cloths. She said, I'd taken it home. My mom sleeps with it every night. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that is good. Woo. Oh. <laughs> oh, they, they were here. They just left uh, uh, five minutes ago. Uh, so, Lord miraculous things would happen so I want to read one scripture out of Deuteronomy and this is going to lead towards another prayer meeting tonight because I feel like we I mean we definitely need to be praying yes. over what's taking place I mean uh, that that God is going to do things miraculously Woo. and uh Deuteronomy 32 Verse 7, it, it says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. And so, uh, God's talk. he's dealing with some other things right there, but he is, he is saying, go back to the generations. And if we look at revival it's taking place, it, it really flows through generations. It's amazing. There are places where the wells of revival have been opened, and it seems to continue. It may be a 40-year span or later, but something seems to happen again in those places. Or it begins to happen from the generations of those who came out of those places. I don't think we realize how significant it is to be where the glory spout's being poured out when it's being poured out. That What the, what the ripple effect is... That goes even through generations. I mean, look at Jonathan Edwards and you read of his downline of generations and how they, they affected our nation. Being presidents of colleges, vice presidents of the United States, lawyers and judges. Because he was there where God was pouring out his spirit. He was a main part of what was taking place. And so I, I had some more information this week. I want to go back just a little bit to go forward but something, uh, kind of the generations in the 1600s, and we talked about after Luther's Reformation, and, uh, and then things kind of die and things begin to pick up. But in Northern Ireland, from 1625 to 1642, there's revival at a place called Ulster. So revival began to break out there. Tough things were going on. There had been wars and battles. Uh, very um, crooked people have moved into the area. But men began to pray. And God began to change things. The amazing thing was that later on in that revival, because of the manifestations, some of those in the clergy got worried and eventually ran off the leaders of revival. So they moved from Northern Ireland to Scotland. And in Scotland, 
in um, Cam, Cam, Campbell's Lang, Cam, uh, Gumbus Lang, uh, in the 1700s, 1742, around there, which we know that was when America was having the first Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards and the Wesleys and Whitfield actually preached there in Scotland in 1742. That was the height of the revival that took place. And the revival that was taking place there, of course, was coming from some of those from Ulster, the generations, even though it's almost 100 years later, it was through the generations of those that were run out of Ulster were the ones that were having hosting revival here in Scotland. And so as revival broke out in Scotland... And one of the things that they did also was communion services. And so during the communion services, there's times when God would begin to move. That's what actually happened in Ulster also. So they were looking back at what their fathers did, and they were doing a similar thing and crying out to God for it to happen again. And it began to happen. But also at uh, uh, Scotland, the manifestations began to appear. Jerking, running, shouting, jumping, slain in the spirit, speaking in tongues. But they really didn't have a revelation of what that was. They just knew something was taking place. And so in the midst of all that beginning to take place, guess who showed up? The theologians saying, this is not God. I mean, there's a, there's a pattern of this deal that, that seems to show why we don't have a continuous revival. Because men get involved and decide, yeah. uh, this, uh, you know, this is getting out of hand. Y'all are getting a little bit weird here. Uh, but there was a man named McCullough who was a, a, a pastor during that time. And he began to study. He studied the manifestations. But what he studied was the people... After they had experienced these manifestations. And he said, the one thing I see is there is fruit coming from those who are experiencing God. They want to pray more. They want to be at church more. They want to worship more. Their lives are being changed. So he says, you know, we can't. We can't look at these manifestations and say this is all bad because out of these manifestations is coming the fruit of the Spirit. So there must be some link between what's happening here and what's happening here. That didn't make the theologians any difference. They still didn't like it. Probably mostly because it's out of their hands. They don't have control on it anymore. Yeah, and heaven's moving and they're out of the picture. Because God, God's wanting to raise up. He said that we were all kings and priests. That's right. But see, there's, there's some that they want to be the king and priest. And you just be the peasant. Altar boy. The altar boy. So out of Scotland, there were, were groups of people that came over, eventually wound up in North Carolina. And some of the eastern coast, you know, from 1742, we had the war, uh, Declaration of Independence. And after that, the war-torn people, you know, it, it had been a tough war and a tough battle for our independence. And so a lot of them weren't that concerned about religion at that time. They just wanted to survive. And, and a guy named Magritte, he he came from that... Scottish downline of people. And now we're not talking about quite a hundred years. And so he comes to North Carolina and he's a very passionate man. He's a revivalist. Uh, some, you know, e- either his grandparents or his parents, they were telling him about what took place. And, you know, he had a hunger and a thirst and a passion for souls And for people to have a personal encounter. Every one of these revivals focused on people having a personal encounter with God. I think that's something that the church has tried to get away from. We don't have time for everybody to have their personal encounter here. Uh, We got, you know, but you need to listen to my 30 minute teaching. So McGreeley's in North Carolina. Until 1997. 
1997, some of the leaders of his nice little church burned his altar down and wrote a message in blood that if you don't leave, you're going to suffer bodily harm. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. Ooh, it's pretty good to have that type of preaching. They said it was passionate. Wow. It was repentance. Wow. And they didn't like it. But it's pretty good to be preaching hard enough that people want to burn your altar and write in blood, you need to leave. Well, let me, there's probably some conviction going on. Woo. So he moves now because after the, the war that had been fought, and the, now he moves like a lot of other people are beginning to move west. But it's not as far west as you think. We're talking about Kentucky well, we're talking about Illinois, we're talking about we're Tennessee, you know, <laughs> that was west. To the Mississippi line, that was kind of to the west uh, before you crossed the Mississippi. And so they had moved up there. Uh, he had moved up there and taken over three churches. And uh, they were, let me see what the name of those churches were. It was Red River, Mud River, and uh, all kind of rivers. But uh, the Red River Church there, which if you've heard much about revival, I believe somebody came here and spoke some on that. Uh, so he's pastoring those three churches. McGreedy is, and he goes back to that passionate preaching again and stirring up revivals. In the midst of this time, there's also a man who is in, um, he's in Virginia. John Blair Smith, he was there in the 1780s. He had revival in Virginia, Farmington, I believe it was. But he uh, started an academy. And he began to teach students about revival and having a passion for revival. Of course, this Smith guy and McGreedy, they all were downline from even from Ulster all the way the generations they're still carrying that fire. So it could be very well that you're in here uh, going after heaven. That it'll be, it'll affect your generations of carriers of revival. Yes, Woo! Yes, Lord. It'll be in your DNA. I wonder if God, somebody will find out that God could put DNA, revival in your DNA. Woo! And so, while McGrady is having these meetings in Kentucky, on the rivers there, three different little places he's pastoring, from, from 1797 to 1799, every summer he's having revival meetings, and God's really beginning to move. And guess what's happening? Manifestations. Of course, during one of the one of the highlights of these revivals is they're taking communion. These things began to happen in nineteen eight. I mean, seventeen eighty. An ant, they call them anti revivalist shows up. Of course. And guess what? Nineteen eighty is a dead zone. Nothing happens. But they go back after. I mean, seventeen eighty. <laughs> I'm not used to saying 17. I mean, we're in the 2000s. <laughs> so two brothers show up. John and William McKee, McGee show up to help him. They're also passionate preachers. And they show up to help him in his three churches to have revival. Uh, during that time period, I just want to read a little here about the, uh, what was going on during that. There was unprecedented, unprecedented moral slump following the American Revolution. 1775 to 1783. Drunkenness was epidemic. Out of a population of 5 million, 300,000 were confirmed drunkards. Wow. That's a pretty high percentage. Yeah. 
confirmed. That's not the ones that are just drinking some. That's the ones that are drunkards. Profanity was of the most shocking kind. For the first time in history of the American settlement, women were afraid to go out at night. Bank robberies were a daily occurrence. In examining the colleges of the time, a poll at Harvard discovered not one believer in the student body, which not that long ago was founded as a Bible school. A, a, much, more in, a much more evangelical place indicated only two believers were there. Students were engaged in rioting. Sound familiar? They had mock communion at Williams College. I mean, it's one thing when you don't believe. It's another thing when you begin to mock God. They forced the resignation of the president of Harvard. They burned a Bible and a public bonfire in New Jersey. Christians were so few on campus, they met in secret like communist cell groups and kept their minutes in code so that no one would know who they were or what they were doing to stop persecution. So we're talking about the late 1700s. Read a little bit more. Not only had the great revival of 1735 been discounted by the world, wickedness in general reached such a crescendo that men of the cloth were despairing about the future of Christendom. So the pastors were wondering if there would even continue to be a Christian church. We hadn't got that far off yet. The great church historian... Of those days, Kenneth Scott Latoury wrote, wrote of this period, It seems that Christianity is about to be ushered out of the affairs of mankind. The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Marshall, a concerned believer, wrote Methodist Bishop Madison of Virginia. He asserted, The church is too far gone to ever be redeemed. Such an absence of Christianity gave rise to the grand area of American uh, agnosticism. The famous atheist Voltaire was immediately declaring Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years. And the agnostic from uh, Tom Paine was joyfully echoing the sentiments all across America to interested listeners. I mean, they thought they had the upper hand. Right. We've got the vote in. It's out. So one Baptist minister decided to start praying. All this is going on. Now you see this is previous up to the 1780s when this man, uh, John Blair Smith, is having revival in Virginia. So there's a pocket of revival going on from the generations before. Man, the devil can't put out the light. And then he's training up revivalists. Then, then 1780... We see the, uh, the atheist attack, or not even atheists, but other ministers attack what's going on in Red River and those places in Kentucky, which, see if it's got it in here, how bad that was. <laughs> yeah, revival was raging back east, but Magritte's area was still unmoved, so that Virginian revival was moving. Logan County was tough. It was otherwise known as Rogue's Harbor. A stream of murderers, robbers, horse thieves, and counterfeiters. Mm. Boat frauders. Yeah. <laughs> to escape punishment from the Union had crossed the Allegheny Mountains and settled in southwestern Kentucky. A court of justice has not, had not been conducted there in five years. Sounds like Philadelphia. The outlaws yeah. constituted a clear majority. Vigilantes, the few law-abiding people, decided they were going to run the, everybody else out of, all the bad guys out of town. And guess what? They got beat. So that didn't even work. 
There were two notable classes, the wild, jeering, cursing, drinking frontiersmen and a small, upper-class, law-abiding, agnostic people. They had removed some of the towns, after, they, had, they had named some of the towns after renowned infidels, Bourbon, Luray, Rasal, Altamont. Churches were not to be found in many Kentucky townships. In some towns of considerable size, a worship service had never been conducted. One observer said, especially among the upper class, deism or ir irreligion ruled beyond all bounds. They were not interested at all. So, in June of 1980, 1780, I was seeing if y'all were listening. Y'all keep me on point here. They did have what broke loose. It's, it says that um, one of the, having instructed the people to examine themselves, they were having another uh, communion service. Three days lest they partake unworthily, a Methodist pastor, John Begee, was asked to preach. He observed the people were breaking up. They were shaking. They were getting messed up. Now, this is McGee. This is the two brothers that said they would help McGrady. Yes. He politely went and spoke to the lady about regaining her composure. <laughs> you know, these people, Presbyterians, are much for order. They will not bear this confusion. Go back and be quiet. I turned to go back and was near falling. That's McGee talking. The power of God was strong upon me. I turned again and losing sight of the fear of man, I went through the house shouting and exhorting with all possible ecstasy, ecstasy and energy. After he just told her to be quiet and sit down. They're praying and they didn't know what they was praying for. And the floor was soon covered with the slain. Their screams for mercy, silence, pierced the heavens. McGee wrote that in the Methodist Magazine, 1821. Notice these Scottish Irish McGee, McGrady. All the way from... Still carrying that fire. So that was the year also that it, it didn't really go on past this. But in the midst of this, a man named Barton Stone, who was from Cane Ridge. He was the pastor at Cane Ridge. He had come over to see what was happening at Red River. He experienced, he may have been there that day. I'm not sure if it says that day. But anyway, he, he saw what was happening. He went back to Cane Ridge and they said, as he began to testify about what he saw, the same thing began to happen at Cane Ridge. Woo. Man, just, just like that pastor we watched that night where he said he went back to his church and he didn't even tell his people where he'd been. He just said, I'm a changed man. And as he began to talk, the power of God began to sweep over his congregation. You know, the, the things that we don't think could be changed in a day. You know, sometimes we, we like they thought, it's, it's too late. This can't happen. Uh, we're too far gone. Christian, Christendom is, it's past. It's 30 years you won't even know there was ever a Christian around but God. Sober professors lay prostrate. No person seemed to wish to go home. This is, then they officially came, the McKee brothers, 
McCready all came to Cane Ridge for a camp meeting that he had scheduled. Barton Stone had scheduled a camp meeting after he saw what was already beginning to happen in his church. And in that ridge, approximately 20,000 people showed up oh. with horses and wagons and from all over the place. It, it was so far out, there wasn't even water available. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I actually got to go see where that was at. And Cane Ridge, around here you say ridge, and it's like on top of a mountain, but it's just kind of rolling hills, and it's kind of up on the top of one of those rolling uh, areas. Is a the largest log cabin uh, in existence at that time, the most spanding, and that's where he had his church at. But so many people come, wow, they couldn't even start to be in that church. And where they had pastors on stumps, up to 10 stumps, pastors preaching wow. to the thousands that were there. Wow. And the power of God sweeping over the whole thing that uh, one man said he climbed to the ridge to look at what was going on. And he said, if you'd had 500 muskets shooting at people, you couldn't have knocked them down as fast as they fell wow. when the Holy Spirit swept over them. <laughs> and he ran back off of the hill terrified. Vigilantes would come try to run through the midst of all the people and knock them out of the way and cause trouble. And they'd come into the midst of them, even on horseback. They'd be slain off their horses and stuck to the ground until they were fully converted. You, know, you, you think, well, you know, uh, God don't do nothing that you wouldn't ask him to. Well, ask those guys. I mean, they probably still had an opportunity to say no, but I don't think the consequences would have been that good. People jerked. I mean, you know, ladies had their hair up in pins, buns, and they'd get to jerking so bad the pins would be flying. And they said their hair actually popped like whips. You could hear the popping going on. So, I mean... We're still pretty tame here. <laughs> One very hard-hearted man who was definitely atheist, hated God. So he's mocking God in the middle of this crazy stuff that's going on. And he begins to jerk because he's laughing at people that are jerking. He begins to jerk. He picks up his whiskey bottle and said, I'm going to drink it till the jerks go. He jerks into a tree, breaks the whiskey bottle. He starts cursing God at the top of his lungs. The jerks get, he falls down on the ground, continues to jerk till it breaks his neck and he dies. Oh. Wow. 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 Yeah. So, um. <laughs> yeah, I believe it brought some more fear of the Lord into the camp. And the others that were mocking God began to shut their mouths. You're not dealing with man anymore. You know, and, and so in the church, we've talked about having the anointing talked about last night, how in the midst of the miracle that God was providing for Elijah and the, and the widow woman with their son, how, how meal and oil came every day for them to eat and make the little cakes and eat and survive. In the midst of that miracle, the son died. Seems like, well, wow, if he's eating that manna from heaven, how could he die? But obviously the enemy didn't like what was going on. And the enemy didn't like what was about to happen. That's right. Because yeah. God had told them, go there. And, and uh, they were in, in the midst of a, of a uh, drought. Mm, drought. Kind of like Colorado. They're in the midst of a drought. And God said, stay with the widow until it begins to rain. Till I tell you it's going to rain. Because then the crops can come back. And so the cool thing, he's hid out in another country. He's away from everything. We were talking last night how, you know, we've kind of been hid out up here on top of the hill. And God's been providing in the midst of that. But, you know, the enemy's come and our nation tried to kill what God wants to do and the widow woman got desperate and began to pray and go to the man of God how dare you know you've, you've come here to do this for me how dare let my son die how could this happen 
and begin to pray. And when God healed the son, then the Lord told him to go now and tell Ahab it's about to rain. Woo. So when, when the word come that it was about to rain, which I believe is the word of revival, yeah. that then he went back into the nation to confront the prophets of Baal and to call down fire. It was kind of a governmental thing. That's right. yeah. I mean, he came to mess up their false religion. That's right. And the people were in a stupor because he said, can you not decide whose God is God? And they're just silent. And then he said, if, if Baal be God, worship him. But if the Lord be God, worship him. And they still hadn't made up their mind till Baal hollered and shouted and cut himself all day and put up posters on the wall so nobody could see what they was doing. (laughs) (laughs) Same old stuff. I mean, can you imagine being the audience at that situation? Because um, they've been worshiping Baal for the last few years. They've been in the system. And now here comes this madman out of nowhere. I mean, it just says Elijah shows up. He goes to the king and he says, it's not going to rain till I say so. That's a madman. You know, we've got a president that's taken a stand, but he does have a, a support of a lot of the church and the prayers of the people. This guy shows up with nothing, but he's got a mandate from heaven. He was a man sent from God. All God needs is one man or one woman sent from God. He can handle the situation. Then even in the midst of that, giving the word of the drought, He has to live in the midst of the drought until God says it's time for something else. The ravens feed him. The widow at Zarephath feeds him. And then God says, now, now it's about to rain. Go back and tell Ahab. And then gather the prophets of Baal on top of the mountain. I mean, can you imagine being in the crowd and here's this one little guy that, like, where did he come from? And you got these 700 prophets of Baal that you've been are hanging around, you know. You've been seeing them do their stuff. Yeah. And he challenged them, okay, build your altar, cut your cow up, call down fire. One man stood against a whole nation, really against the whole world. Yeah. 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 Ooh, do we realize the power? Of one or two that will take a stand. And then not only that. When they're cutting their self and hollering. He's over there mocking them. Where's your God? Is he asleep? Maybe he's out relieving himself. I mean. (laughs) Yeah. Yell louder. He don't hear you. Panic zone. And then he just kind of casually says, Lord, send the fire. (laughs) The water's gone. The cow's gone. The altar's gone. Everything's gone. (laughs) And the people are like, oh, (laughs) his God is God. This God. This one over here, he's God. I mean, we read Mario last night. He said, God's about to do something no man will get credit for. And it will bring glory to God that people will declare that God. He is God. Jesus is God. Woo! You know, if you read, if you read the, the biggest thing I see in Judges, and you're all are familiar in Judges chapter 2. Verse 10, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. The most dangerous thing is for 
a generation living right now not to experience an encounter with God. Imagine there's a lot of them there rioting in the streets that have been in a church somewhere. But have they experienced an encounter with God? Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. Why? Because they didn't have an encounter with God. A generation rose up that didn't, the stories weren't told anymore. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Hallelujah. So later on, God had to send a man to deal with that stuff. Ooh, man, not only did he call down fire, then he took the prophets down in the valley and executed every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty yeah. gory. Yeah. And we know and that's a sign of the spiritual world for what we live in now. I mean, the battles of the Old Testament, I believe, they were in the flesh battles, but they represent how we make war against the enemy now. And that's why all, all idols have to be killed. I mean, stuff that we're dealing in that's not pleasing with God, it's not just put on the shelf, it's killed. It's put in the fire, it's burned, it's done away with. It's out of our lives. Woo! We deal with the enemy harshly. Then heaven shows up. When they, some of the results, the call of prayer and repentance resulted in thousands flocking the Gasper River, Kentucky, in 1800. It was 1801 that Cane Ridge came about. Because no facilities existed, they could house or clothe this many Blankets and tent were secured. Services were conducted in the wild, and the first camp meeting was born. That's a year before Cane Ridge. So there's 11,000 here, and then Cane Ridge is 20,000. But I love this. No person seemed to wish to go home. Hunger and sleep seemed to affect nobody. It's amazing. At Cane Ridge only lasted a week because there was no water and no food. And they had all their animals up there who, who carried the wagons. Said they don't know how they lasted a week. But somehow, supernaturally, they lasted. And it was day and night. People were slain in the spirit. People would be picked up and put in wagons. They'd lay on the ground for hours and hours and hours. Hunger and sleep seemed to affect nobody. They didn't live to eat. They ate to live. Eternal things were of vast concerns. Sober professors who had been communicants for many years were now laying prostrate on the ground, crying out in such a language as this. Oh, how I would have despised any person a few days ago who would have acted like I'm acting now. They look down their long nose and despise. I can't believe you're doing that. Persons of every description, white and black, were to be found in every part of the multitude crying out for mercy. Can you imagine being in that camp and all night long, people on the ground crying for mercy, people shaking. After hours, people getting up and shouting and singing said singing was like the singing of angels with no instruments. McGreedy wrote about that part right there. there. There on the edge of the prairie, multitudes came together. The scene was new and strange. It baffled description. Many, very many fell down as men slain in battle and continued for hours together in an apparently breathless and motionless state. They said many fell face first into the mud and did not move for hours. Wow. 
I guess they didn't know about catchers then. <laughs> we got a yeah, we got a new revelation now. <laughs> I don't know if they fell and hit a stone on their way down <laughs> and were knocked out for several hours. <laughs> I don't think so. They weren't in the Rocky Mountains, they were in the ridges of Kentucky. <laughs> You know, there's uh, Clay Nash and them were talking about uh, that they've just recently been baptizing people forward. Uh, there seems to be something happening. They used to say if you fell forward when you were prayed for, you were probably called into the ministry. Now, I don't think that has a little lot of theological background, but that's what people would say at times. In August of 1801, Pastor Stone's invitation, because he was at that Gasper River seeing that also, 20,000 to 25,000 people crowded the little church house. Masses of humanity could be seen for what looked like miles on the sparsely populated frontier. Pastor Stone expressed shock as he observed the multitudes continuing to pour in for a six-day protracted meeting. The roads, he reported, were crowded with wagons, carriages, horses, and footmen making it to the solemn camp. Man, they had, they had, they had to really make an effort to get to where they were going because most came within 100 miles or so. Can you imagine 100 miles on horseback or wagon or whatever getting to Cane Ridge where there's not, there's not in a city, there's not a whole lot to offer there. Just think about, too, how, how out of the way that place was to get to. But when the Spirit of God showed up there, hungry people. Woo, this place is kind of out of the way, too. Yes, it is. It is. Woo. Yes, it is. We do have water. Bathrooms, toilet paper, carpet, baptistry. Yeah, we can get that for you, Polly. Yeah, we can. We can. Uh, it'd be hard to find some out there. So we'll see. Rock after you get through the little bit of dirt. Yeah. All appeared cordially united of one mind and one soul the salvation of sinners was the one object we all engaged in singing the same songs all united in prayer all preached the same things and and there were methodist baptists and presbyterians were the main ones there were, so you had calvinists and armenians coming together yeah opposite and the the cry was they decided that this gospel's for all amen everybody that will come Cane Ridge meeting, August 1801, 25,000 came. Ministers cut down trees for pulpits. Others used stumps, and some preach from flatbeds of wagons. Thousands were mightily converted at Cane Ridge. Some received visions of Jesus. Others received calls to the ministry, not at least, which was a man named Peter Cartwright. Amazing man. I counted seven ministers all preaching at one time, some on stumps, others in wagons. Some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying for mercy. I mean, you know, some people think, well, God's a God of order. He can't, you know, we got to have everything in order here. But if you read about the great awakenings, great revivals of our time, it looked, it was pretty much, yeah. What was it? other night I read something disorder uh, I don't know maybe it'll come I stepped up to on a log where I could have a better view of the surging sea of humanity this was this was a Methodist circuit writer who wrote 
uh, later about these services. At one time, I saw at least 500 people swept down in a moment as if a battery of a thousand guns had been opened upon them and immediately followed shrieks and shouts that rent the very heavens. Can you imagine? I mean, at one time, just, it, it, it just they're out there preaching, and all of a sudden, he said, like, it's like a thousand guns fired on them, shrieks and hollering and crying and falling to the ground. That's a little disorder. Yeah. Godly disorder. The governor attended. I attended Cane Ridge with 18 Presbyterian ministers and Baptists and Methodists. They preached continually for that six days pretty much. I do not know how many all either preaching or exhorting the distressed with more harmony than could be expected, the governor of our state was with us and encouraged the work. The number of the people counted, 21,000. The people, the whole people, serious. All the conversation was of a religious nature. Great numbers were on the ground from Friday until Thursday. That's a week. Great numbers on the ground. Rally. <laughs> Ooh, wouldn't that be the miracle if he has a rally in Philadelphia? 30,000 people got slain in the spirit. <laughs> Until Thursday following, night and day without intermission engaged in some religious act of worship. They are commonly collected in a small circle of 10 or 12, close adjoining numbers, another circle, and all engaged in singing hymns. And then a minister steps on a stump or a log and begins an exhortation or sermon when as many as can hear collect around him. On Sabbath night, I saw above 100 candles burning at once. And I saw, I suppose, 100 persons of all ages from 8 to 60 years at once on the ground crying for mercy. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That's a holy wave. That's a when a person is struck down, he is carried by others out of the congregation where some minister converses with and prays for him. Afterwards, a few gather around and sing a hymn suitable to his case. <laughs> The sensible, the weak, the learned, and the unlearned, the rich and the poor are the subjects of it. Like Azusa Street. No, no class and no race. At Cynthiana, Paris, Flat Creek, Point Pleasant, Walnut Hill, and Georgetown, great congregations are in all these places and exercise in the manner as described above. In Cumberland, the work is also great. They often meet in congregations of 25,000 and spend sometimes two weeks. So this was the beginning of camp meeting. N yeah, no buildings would hold the people. So they had to go to the outdoors. Of course, they were rough frontiersmen anyway. What are the results? Word of the great revival in Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina spread to the east. George Baxter, president of Washington College, Virginia, visited the scene and recorded words about the metamorphosis of this once sin-sick frontier system. On my way, I was informed by settlers on the road that the character of Kentucky travelers was entirely changed and that they are as remarkable for sobriety as they have formerly been for dissoluteness. So now they're, now they're remarkably sober as much as at one time they were drunks. And immorality. And indeed, I found Kentucky the most moral place I have ever seen. A religious... Awe seemed to pervade the country. 
upon the whole, I think the revival in Kentucky, the most extraordinary that has ever visited the church of Christ. And all things considered, it was peculiarly adapted to the circumstances, to the country into which it came. Infidelity was triumphant. Here's a capture of everything. And religion was on the point of expiring. Something extraordinary seemed necessary to arrest the attention of a giddy people who were ready to conclude that Christianity was a fable. This revival has done it. It has confounded infidelity, awed vice into silence, and brought numbers beyond calculation under serious impressions. Woo. See what we're going after. God can do it. Above and beyond our wildest imagination, anything we can believe or ask for. If he's done it in the past, God, we take, we, we uh, go back to what our elders of the past said. At this, when Cane Ridge hit, uh, they said most of those students from Virginia had come over to be involved in what happened at Cane Ridge also. So God brought the other revivalists in there as catalysts for what God wanted to do in the midst of it. College students. Woo! So that, that fire. Yes. Woo! BLM and Antifia. Antifa. Woo! They're looking for something. They're searching for something. There's an empty spot there. I mean, when it's anger and bitterness and... Uh, just craziness. There's something that's empty there that hadn't been filled. I believe they're looking, you know, and they've been attracted to that, but they're going to find out it's fool's gold. It's going to leave them just as empty the next day as it was the day before. But they're going to find something that's going to fill them up. Hallelujah. Woo! Heaven's going to invade their uh, situation. Yeah, that's people. Would, people would be buried there, and then their family would be off and say, "When I die, take me to Cane Ridge and bury me." And and there was not enough room, so they dig up and put it on top of the other coffin, and they would be several coffins deep around there. The sad part is, there's they don't call themselves a denomination, but that's what they are. I won't name them. But they, they are the curators, and they came out of that. They're one of the groups that came out of that revival. And <clears throat> I went there. Now that log building is covered by a bigger building to protect it. And it's pretty amazing to go in there and, and then walk around the grounds and think about what happened. But that denomination is totally against anything of the spirit moving. I mean, it's hard to believe, but that's what we see time after time. Some wise theologian comes in and says, well, that's not really necessary. I talked to the curator of the grounds there and asked, you know, he said, this stuff happened. They have a bookstore where they're selling books, talking about all these manifestations. And I said, well, it don't, you know, why, why does this stuff not happen now? And he said, well, that was revival. And I said, when we got in the church... We got calmed down and in control. And I said, so you don't have any more revivals? And he said, he, it stunned him for a minute. Like, yeah, we do. But it must not. You're not having this stuff happen. Good question. Good question. Um, amen. Uh, heaven will shake that place and the curator will get messed up. Ooh, and he'll start telling the other curators. Yeah. Because they're, they're, that's why you don't see many um, 
they're very, very cautious about who. I mean, they'll let anybody go in there, but he followed us around the whole time just watching. They don't want you to go in there and pray in the Spirit or sing in the Spirit or really go after heaven. So they kind of, there, there are a few prophets that have been able to get in there and, uh, with some type of permission. There's some videos on YouTube of them and they're worshiping and stuff. But it's sad that that well of revival is being stifled by the ones that were the very part of the founders of the. Oh, yeah, we can, we can pray for them. Nothing's impossible. That God would sweep over that thing again or either <laughs> let their days be few and let another take their office. Yeah, yeah that's well said. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lord, we don't want a generation to slip by that hasn't had an opportunity to have an encounter with God. I mean, we see what stopped revival in the past was people came up with some idea that this is not God. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the numbers are close. In five states around Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and above, I believe, Illinois or Indiana, five states the, the churches in those five states, the whole, like they said, the, I believe the Presbyterians quadrupled in number. The Methodists tripled in number and the Baptists doubled in number from that one week of revival. Of course, we read there it, it went out into other areas. Camp meetings expanded from there, but, the, you know, the people that got the fire there took it out into other areas. But it was such a fire burning that it, I mean, it, <clears throat> it built the church. Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, all of them, it blew up. I mean, there's, there's communities in my area, Bethel, and there's different communities named after names in the Bible because they came out of that revival and founded that community. And... and 1624, Ulster, all the way through till it winds up in Kentucky. G generally, just historically, <laughs> about a hundred years after a denomination is founded, it pretty well is dead. It's founded in the midst of revival. I mean, actually, the Cumberland Presbyterian came out of this, in the midst of this, Cumberland Mountain. But they separated because of their uh, joyous worship, uh, you know, their passionate worship and stuff. So they separated from the original Presbyterians and called Cumberland because of that. One of the main things I know of a rift in the church and they separated but now you visit the Cumberlands too and but I, I think it can you know if when you get to the Welch revival Evan Roberts wasn't I mean he wouldn't I don't think be considered in that upper class elite person and he still because because he uh, physically had a, had a mental and physical breakdown. And we'll talk about um, Welch Revival. But this widow woman who was quite wealthy a lot of, took him in to help restore him. And then she convinced him most of what took place was not God. Him and her actually wrote a book together kind of de uh, denouncing the revival. So, I mean, the enemy will try to convince you, you could have a great encounter with God. That doesn't mean that the enemy isn't going to come and try to convince you that that didn't happen or it wasn't God. Because your mind will start thinking, oh, was that God or was that not God? Or, you know, did, was I just hypnotized or uh, did they work up, did they stir and work me up into this thing that's happening to me? Hard to work somebody up that's getting baptized. I mean... 
because because the water's just you know just. Yeah. Yeah. So don't let the enemy try to convince you that what's happened to you, your encounter with God is, was just some fluke. And sometimes it'll be when you'll have a powder, powerful encounter with God and then two weeks later you're like, where's God? I don't feel him. And that's the, that's the times where we don't go by feelings. I mean, God's still God. He did what he did. And... Uh, you know, I believe he's going to do it again. I, 20, 25 years since, um, probably 28 years since I started encountering God. And there's been ups and downs. I, I can't remember any time that I backslid and turned and walked away from God at all. But there's probably been some dry times, but it hadn't been... It hadn't been a whole year at a time. So you just keep going after it. You know, the, the dry times is where you go find people that aren't dry. I think that's the biggest key. If you're, if you're in a dry season, man, go get around some people. If you've got to take a week off or two weeks and you find where something's happening, just go sit in the midst of them. Yeah. That's what we're providing here is a watering hole for the holy spirit for those that are dry and thirsty to come by and get a drink yep. some people drink too much no not really we need our regular church drunks yes, we do. Imperative. somebody you can rely on to be a heavy drinker yes. night after night Amen. Staple. Staple <laughs> yeah. you just guarantee it <laughs> Fire more. <laughs> she she got I thought she was she got smart. She had two seats over there so she could lay <laughs> but <laughs> Couldn't even stay in the two seats. I guess you'll just have to come in on a cot. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Jerking, shouting, dancing. They didn't understand what singing in the spirit was, but they said they began to sing in other languages that were just amazing. Uh, so all, all the stuff, we really hadn't seen nobody just jerking like that. I mean, popping the bobby pins out and <laughs> popping their hair like a whip. Of course, you probably got to have pretty good long hair to do that, but we have had some people cause a tidal wave in the baptistry. Oh yeah. So, hallelujah. Glory. Lord, we just we thank you for this night, God. We thank you for what you're doing. In fact, we'll probably uh, gather together and get in our circle and pray a little bit. God, we're, we're at a time where we, we're continuing to cry out for revival, and we're in definite need of revival, Lord. Yes. God, uh, it's, it's a point of desperation, and I thank you, Lord, that people show up during the week, and some of them drive several miles to be here lord Amen. to you know there's it's great to watch it online but there's nothing like personally being uh, i remember it brownsville you got there early so you could get in the main sanctuary it held about two thousand, and then once it was filled they ran you over to the chapel 650 then they put you in the choir room in the back and then they'd put you in the cafeteria and so they could get up to, I think, close to 5,000. And eventually, God, in the summer, they put up some tents where they could hold 7,000. 
7,500 uh, all over the campus. But man, you wanted to be in that main room. I mean, they, they shot satellite at, not satellite, but wired all, screens in all buildings. But, oh yeah. Chinese, Chinese and Japanese charter complete planes and fly into there. I mean, they, they had uh, systems for about five different languages could be interpreted. You know, they wear the headset and they had people interpreting that many different languages. And uh, like I said, from all over the world. Five years, Father's Day of 1995 to, I mean, it, it went on some longer, Father's Day of 2000, but Steve Hill stepped back and said, I'm not going to be here every day. I think he's there once a week for a while, and other people would fill in at times, but it's, it was on the downhill side uh, after Father's Day. And uh, a lot of it was caused by us. A split. I mean, that took the wind out of the sail. Yeah. December. Yeah. December. No, they they had um, they had prayer on Tuesday nights at the at the very start. They had prayer on Monday nights, and then they had Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the pastor preached on Sunday. Uh, then it. I don't know, within a year, I think, they started having prayer on Tuesday nights, so everybody got Monday off. They had prayer on Tuesday nights, and they'd have, they'd usually have 1,000 to 2,000 people at prayer. Wow. So people would come early for the week, or people would come in from out of town, and they'd come for the prayer meeting, uh, which people would pray all over the sanctuary, and that's the banners they had up. They'd pray at the banners, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Steve Hill preached. As far as I know, five years, he never missed a night of that. Not that I've heard of. And he did all the preaching. The other amazing thing is a young lady, 14 years old, named Charity, that sang the song Mercy Seat at the end, uh, at the altar time. And as far as I know, she sang it every night. There may have been one or two nights God did something else, but... She was there every, from 14 to 19, almost 19 years old singing that song. She grew up every night singing that song before thousands of people from all over the world. Yeah. She's on Facebook. You can Facebook friend her. And, uh, but she's a very humble young lady. No. No, um, the Bible school split. Um, we'll talk about that. That's another hundred years into history. <laughs> oh, actually, two hundred years. No, two hundred years. Uh, yeah. So we're going through the history of things to see at at, <clears throat> at every revival there. There came a, a time where people got dry and finally had to turn back to God and say, God, we need you. And, and as the church got dry, sin got rapid. I mean, the church is holding back. Yeah. The church is bringing the light and the salt into yeah. communities. And when the church compromises, it affects the world. And finally, the effect of the world gets so bad, just like the book of Judges and Israel began to cry out again after they became captive from the outsiders because they began to worship what they worshiped. They became almost slaves, which is what happens. Sin enslaves us yep. until we get to the point of desperation and begin to cry out again for God to send his spirit and move. But we believe we're coming to a place in time where we won't have that dry spell Amen. of compromise. Never. Never. Yeah. That we will move from glory to glory. Amen. That we'll move into the coming of the kingdom of God. Amen. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Woo, that, I mean, it'll be an invasion. It's still, there'll still be a battle going on. There'll still be people that are lost. There'll still be people who take a stand against it. But there'll be a momentum in the church and a fire in the church yeah. and a presence of God in the church yeah. that, that's not going anywhere. Yeah. Whew, I'm just praying it's in my generation. Yeah. And
understand you have some people in this church that were part of previous revivals. <laughs> so that generational thing can come. Huh? Oh, we are? Woo! So we are going to do a baptism, praise God. Ooh, Lord, we just pray. God, we pray over that. Pray over the Bible. God, we thank you that there's something in the water that it's not just a symbol, Lord God, but you're doing something. It's a circumcision of the flesh. God, that the old things are being cut off. The old man is dying in that water, God. And Father, any, any uh, demonic activity that's going on, Father, I pray when they go down the water, that water will burn any spirit that's there. And it's got to come out in the name of Jesus. Yeah. It's got to loose God's people and let them go. Yeah. God, I pray that water would be like torment to the devils. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It would be a tormenting water for them. Yeah. God, once those termites leave the body, The house is not demon-possessed yet. It's just got a lot of termites eating away at the foundation. But once they flee the body, then the Holy Spirit can come and fill the body. Woo! God, we pray for a baptism of fire in the water, Lord. That whenever they come out, God, that fire, as they come up, that fire is going to get on them. It's life-changing, God. So, amen. So, when we do the baptism, we'll get everybody up here praying. We'll do the baptism, and then we'll just see what God does. Is that okay? So, who's getting? He got baptized Sunday. 